Okay, so in, in saying, when I'm saying that receiving gifts comes with a cost, uh, I'll give you an illustration. Here's, here's what I mean by that. When I was a freshman in high school, I decided that it was time to make my move on my middle school crush. Um, and I decided that, there, that I had a particular way that I was going to do that. I talked to this girl all through middle school. I show up and go to her volleyball games. We're friends. She'll talk to me. She'll text me, all these things. But there's never that transition. That transition never happens. So my freshman year of high school, I'm at the beach, and I do the only logical thing I can think of. I buy her one of these, like, $10 piece of junk necklaces from, like, the little island things at, at Barefoot down at the beach. And so I bring this gift back to my middle school crush, my freshman year of high school, and I go to hand it to her on a Monday, and she says, no. I got a, Caroline, I got you a gift. No. No. She's fine to talk to me. She's fine to text me. She's fine to communicate with me in the stands while I watch her play volleyball. She won't take my necklace. Caroline, even as a 14-year-old, understood that gifts come with cost. They mean something. The verses that we're considering tonight capture two costs of setting our faces to lead lives of wisdom. If we follow the exhortation of verse 16 to receive the gift of wisdom and to walk in the gift of wisdom, what will that mean for us? What are the costs? First, I think it comes with the cost of living on guard, the cost of living on guard. Verse 17, the highway of the upright turns aside from evil. Whoever guards his way preserves his life. As we consider this verse, and as we'll consider verse 18 in a few minutes, the first thing that we notice is that we're still dealing with parallelism like we did last week. So her, parallelism, again, to, to give you an example, her car is red, the color of a summertime tomato. How much better to get wisdom than gold to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. Now tonight, the highway of the upright turns aside from evil. Whoever guards his way preserves his life. Both verses 17 and verse 18, they represent one idea apiece. One idea expressed in two parallel ways. Verse 17, it exhorts us to guard our way, to turn aside from evil. Walking in the path of the upright, preserving our lives, this is what it means for us to walk in wisdom. How do we know that verse 17 is an outworking of wisdom? I think it's because of the end of chapter 16, verse 6, which says, By the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. And the fear of the Lord, we know from last week, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That fear of the Lord is how we turn away from evil. That is how we live our lives on guard. Wisdom is rooted in fearing the Lord, and fearing the Lord leads to turning away from evil. Thus, to turn away from evil, to guard our way, is to walk in wisdom. It's nothing more than receiving the gift of wisdom. Put like that, I feel like it sounds pretty simple, right? Fear the Lord. Get the foundational gift of wisdom. Live life in light of that gift. But what I want to remind you of tonight is that gifts mean something. To accept a gift is to agree to the terms of that gift. In, in the halls of York Comprehensive High School, taking possession of my necklace incurs the cost of having folks think that we're something more than friends. It seems that we understand that reality really well as 14-year-olds when it comes to our romantic pursuits, but we tend to struggle with that as adults thinking about how to walk in wisdom. As I tried to demonstrate last week, Christian wisdom, biblical wisdom, is Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now here's where the rubber starts to meet the road. If biblical wisdom, if godly wisdom says that the best means to the best ends is Jesus Christ and him crucified, then wisdom comes very the wisdom is never very far removed from a consideration of our own sinfulness. Jesus' death means nothing apart from a consideration of our sin. 
When you say you're a Christian, when you say that you're trusting the gospel, what you're saying is that you agree with God about your sin. You agree with God that his justice demands punishment. You agree with God that you are completely unfit to be with him. And when you say that you're a Christian, you're saying that you rejoice in the fact that God sent his son to to live a life without sin, to pay the punishment on behalf of your sin, to reconcile you to the Father, to be born again. Friends, that's the news of the cross. If you've walked in here tonight and you're not trusting Christ, this is the hope I have to offer you. The, the payment that Christ has made, it can be credited to your account. The life you live now doesn't have to be the life that you used to live. Just as God raised Jesus up to live again, God can raise you up to walk in newness of life tonight. The crucifixion of Christ was because we're sinners. Which means, if we will walk in light of wisdom, if we will walk in light of Christ crucified, we will have to pay particular attention to our relationship with sin. It's tough to say that you love Christ and that you simultaneously love what he had to suffer and die for. Pretty hard to say that you delight in Christ while you delight in the reason that he was crucified. Accepting the gift of the gospel accepting the gift of Christ crucified, accepting the gift of wisdom, it it comes with terms. The terms of turning away from evil, the cost of living a life on guard. And God's people have known this in every area. Consider how Psalm 1 starts. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way with sinners, nor sits in the seats of scoffers. Or consider the the well-known example of this truth from Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 27, he says, You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Across time and place, God's people have understood that walking on the highway of the upright means turning aside from evil. If you want to keep your soul, watch your way. If you want to save your life, be careful in your conduct. Trusting in Christ crucified or walking in wisdom or living by faith means living life on guard. Do you live your life on guard? Will you live your life on guard when it's inconvenient? Because it gets inconvenient. In encouraging you to live life on guard, I'm inviting you to live inconveniently. That's why I'm calling it a cost. You can't go through life looking pretty much like everyone else and pretty much doing the same things the same way as everyone else and genuinely say that you're living life on guard. Now, you have to make some changes to live life on guard. This clicked for me in college. I was riding home from school for Christmas break. Uh, I've been a Christian for approximately two months. I was listening to a CD. Yes, like an actual physical compact disc in the, in the CD player, uh, and it had some devotions on it. And, and on one of those devotions, there was a guy who used uh, an illustration about him and his pre-teen, preteen son, and they were sitting on, couch, on the couch watching TV. And, and they were sitting there, and, and this commercial came on, and, and the main character in the commercial was a highly attractive, provocatively dressed woman, and the dad was sitting there ready for it. He had the remote in his hand, the commercial comes on, he changes the channel, and he looks at his son and says, it's disrespectful to your mom for me and you to watch this. And that rocked me. As a 19-year-old, I had never considered the sacrifices that I would have to make on the level of everyday life to walk in wisdom. Now, no one is arguing that living in that way is convenient. It's not but it's wise. It's part of turning aside from evil. It's part of guarding your way. It's part of preserving your life. 
In the same way, no one is arguing that it's convenient to have content filters on your computer. Microsoft Word needs to run an update, and you've got to call three buddies to make a trip across town so that you can use your computer again. That, that's, that's not convenient, but it may be the wise thing for you to do. No, you, no one's arguing that it's convenient to avoid eating in restaurants that have bars. That's going to limit your options. That's going to make all of those where do you want to eat conversations pretty difficult. That's not convenient, but that may be what walking in wisdom looks like for you. And recall that the man who's blessed in Psalm 1, he doesn't just stay away from the wicked and from the sinners and from the scoffers. He also soaks himself in the Word. And he loves to soak himself in the Word. He delights in the law of the Lord. We ought to be soaking ourselves in the Word. This is the life of the godly. But, you know, I don't care how much you delight in the Word or how much you love soaking in the Word. It takes sacrifice to consistently soak yourself in the Word. It costs you something to consistently be in the Word. I think for most of us, it costs us sleep. Uh, my quiet time tends to be in the morning, which means that I have to build that in when I set my alarm. Now, it, it doesn't feel that inconvenient anymore because I've been doing it for a long time. I'm kind of used to it, but it costs me a little bit of sleep. It makes me shift my bedtime. It doesn't allow me the convenience of waking up 20 minutes before I need to leave my house. But it's essential for renewing my mind. It helps me to turn away from evil. It helps me to guard my way. It's part of preserving my life. Are you willing to live life inconveniently? Are you willing to pay the cost of living life on guard? The way of wisdom is the way of right conduct. The way of wisdom turns aside from evil. The way of wisdom flees sin. Living your life on guard is how you preserve it. If you would watch out for your soul, you must commit to watching out for sin, whether that's convenient or not. The highway of the upright turns aside from evil. Whoever guards his way preserves his life. Secondly, I think walking in wisdom comes with the cost of living in the open. The cost of living in the open. Verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Uh, again, my, my proposition to you is that this verse flows from wisdom. The exhortation to put pride to death, the exhortation to live humbly is another facet of walking in wisdom. How can we see that? Uh, consider with me Proverbs 11, verse 2. It says, When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble, it is wisdom. So, so the biblical counter to pride is humility. And those who walk in humility are walking in wisdom, not just abstract wisdom, but biblical wisdom, gospel wisdom, the wisdom that is Christ crucified. And the wisdom that is Christ crucified said, says, be humble. The message of the cross is that you are far worse than you ever imagined you could be. And God is a far more merciful God than you ever imagined he might be. Your salvation has nothing to do with your value or your competence. It has to do with God's desire to save a people for himself. To do that to the praise of his glory. And those of us who are in Christ are beneficiaries of his grace, completely irrespective of our merit or lack thereof. And now, even if you've been reconciled to God in Christ, the gospel of grace alone, through faith alone, reminds you every day that you have good reason to walk in humility. If you exuded the fruits of the Spirit today, just remember they're the fruits of the Spirit. They're fruits of God's work, not your work. If you woke up confident in Christ this morning and you're still sitting here confident in Christ this evening, it's not because of who you are, it's because of who he is. In John chapter 6, verse 37, Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Brothers and sisters, your coming is owing to his calling. And your remaining is because his heart is committed to holding on to you. Not because you're great at holding on to him. 
So if you can't take credit for, for coming to Christ, and if you can't take credit for remaining in Christ, and if the only thing you actually contribute to the entire work of God redeeming you is the sin that desperately you need to be redeemed from, it becomes pretty difficult to see how we could simultaneously understand the gospel and love good doctrine and manage to be arrogant at the same time. And ironically enough, we can see instances where prizing good doctrine actually becomes the basis of this arrogance. And and when we see that, we're, we're reminded that you can come to know more things about God without actually knowing God better. Because if you take a person who knows lots and lots of things about God and you take a humble person, I'm going to argue that this humble person knows God better than the person who knows lots and lots of things about God. If you can maintain a haughty spirit and look at the cross at the same time, you must not understand what's going on at the cross all that well. The cross is there because we're weak and because we sin. And it declares that any hope for us will come on the basis of Jesus' work, not mine or yours. If there's a place left on the face of the earth where pride and arrogance and turn-up-the-nose dispositions are absent, it should be in this room. We've gathered to sit under a word that tells us that all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. A word that tells us that we're so messed up that God had to make him to be sin who knew no sin to keep us from being eternally banished from the presence of his grace. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. This is what the way of wisdom avoids. Walking in wisdom means putting pride to death. And that costs you something. It's the cost of living life in the open. You see, here's the thing. Let me let you in on on a little tiny secret here. Proud people don't tend to notice that they're proud. Arrogant people don't tend to notice that they're arrogant, right? Duh. Uh, We care about the way we're perceived. And, And if we thought that people perceived that we're prideful, we'd stop trying to come across as prideful so that people might perceive us better, right? That's kind of a, a vicious cycle. It turns out the folks who struggle most tangibly with pride tend to have no idea that they're prideful. That's how sin works, right? It's deceitful. It keeps us from seeing things as we ought. It keeps us from seeing ourselves as we ought. I was picking a retired pastor's brain one day about preaching, and, and he decided he would tell me a story. Uh, it's fictional as far as I know, uh, but I've shared it the other week with some folks, and it brought, me, brought it to mind. Uh, he told me one day in a very traditional Baptist church in a little small country town, the pastor was having a real problem with one of his deacons. He was not qualified. He checked all these boxes. He was stumbling in various different types of sins. And the preacher decided, I've got to fix this. These people are never going to follow me as long as we got this guy in leadership. So I'm going to preach at him every week. And something's going to happen. He's going to repent, or he's going to step down, or he's going to leave the church or something. But I'm going to preach at him every week. So for a month, the preacher just gets in here and writes a sermon, just thinking all about this guy. How, how, what can I say about this guy? How can I show this guy I'm talking about him this morning? And he preaches right at the guy Every week for a month. And every week, the deacon meets him at the back door while he's shaking hands and said, Preacher, you told him today. You told him today. So uh, one Sunday comes, and uh, the preacher's at church early. He decides we're going to have to cancel service. They were having some, some weather issues coming in. And the deacon was the only guy who didn't get the memo. So the preacher says, this is too good an opportunity to miss. It's just me and the deacon. Let's have church. we got to have church. I wrote my sermon. The, the deacon showed up. So he's wrote his sermon just thinking about the deacon. And they have church, and it's just him preaching. And it's just the deacon sitting there. They sing a song. He gets in the pulpit, and he preaches right at the guy. The whole service. Stands at the back door, customary. And the deacon comes walking by, and he says, Preacher, if they'd have been here, you would have told him." <laughs> <laughs> and he, and he, cl- he told me that story. He closed that story because he said, you know, one of the most frustrating things about preaching is not being able to tell people that you're talking about them, right? But since I don't want to go home frustrated, I will tell you tonight that if, as we've thought about humility for the last few minutes, if you've been looking around saying, hmm, I wonder who needs to hear this, then you're the one, right? We have answered your question. I didn't tell them, I told you, right? Uh, yeah, so, so sin is deceitful, right? 
And your pride will blind you to your own faults. Our desire to be thought well of by others will keep us from thinking accurately about ourselves. So if we're going to walk in wisdom, we'll have to pay the cost of living our lives in the open. We need to do life together. We need deep relationships. Friends, we need the body. All of us have parts of our lives that are invisible to us. And when we live alongside one another well, when we love each other well, when we spend time with each other, when we come to trust that we're in pursuit of one another's spiritual best interests, all of a sudden, paint starts showing up on these parts of our lives that we we didn't even know that we had. Our relationships with one another, they teach us things about ourselves that we didn't even know that we needed to know. It's good that we stick around and talk to one another until 9 o'clock on Wednesday nights. It's good that we form friendships. It's good that we go out to eat. It's good that we go and drink coffee. It's good that we take road trips, live life with the body. And let some saints in at a deep enough level that they can throw some paint on who you really are. It will cost you something, but it's better than the alternative. Lone wolves die hard deaths. So you will incur cost as you walk in wisdom, as you seek to live life in accordance with the gospel. But oh my, are they costs that we should delight in pain. Friends, let's live life on guard. Let's live life out in the open. Let's love one another well. The highway of the upright turns aside from evil. Whoever guards his way preserves his life. Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Let's pray. Oh Lord, again, what a privilege to be here. We love you. I pray that we would delight ourselves in your word and that we would delight ourselves in obedience to it. Oh Lord, help us to live our lives on guard. Help us to live our lives out in the open. Help us to love each other well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.